Are you ready to perform at your highest potential? Thank you for joining this GP Strategies webinar, where we'll explore best practices and innovative insights to help you and your organization improve performance. So hello and welcome to Learning Trends 2024, Back to the Future, revisiting the fundamentals of learning with our presenter, Matt Donovan. Matt is our Chief Learning and Innovations Officer here at GP Strategies, and he's, re he's a recognized name in learning, bringing 25 plus years of crafting learner-centric solutions and leading high impact teams. He has a background in instructional design and leads workshops, speaks at global events, and has won many industry awards. We have a wonderful session. Again, thank you for joining us, and I'm going to hand it over to you, Matt. Yeah, thank you. And uh, assume that everybody can hear me. Uh, we're good to go. Uh, looking forward to the session today. I tell you that uh, it is so great to see just even in the chat so many different locations and uh, uh, some good friends and some colleagues and uh, a whole bunch of new friends and colleagues, hopefully, as we go through this. So what I'd like to call out a little bit is um, a little bit more about myself. And that was a great intro. I appreciate kind of teeing me up. But I do want to share that, um, you know, as we kind of talk about looking towards the future here, uh, AI will definitely be one of the topics we talk about. I am an AI enthusiast, but I am 100% pro-human. I think you'll hear that as a theme as we're going through, as we talk about how AI also kind of walks into some of the other key areas that uh, the trends that we'll be talking about as well. I am a classically trained instructional designer. I do refer to myself as a recovering instructional designer. That isn't a positive forward thinking uh, almost a growth mindset around that and thinking that we've learned a lot of good skills in the past, but as we enter into the world of AI, being able to help us design, develop, or even deliver, uh, the opportunity to think differently about how we design those experiences will be important as we move forward with that. So anyway, that's a little bit for me, but I would ask you that if you have the opportunity to truly enjoy this, please connect with me on LinkedIn. I'd love to continue the conversation. Um, I just love talking about this stuff. So let me kind of dig into our first uh, element. We've got seven trends that we're going to cover today. And I think the thing that I came here with was back to the future and really about revisiting the fundamentals of learning. And the reason I, I kind of came with that is that looking back in 2023, so much of our energy and conversation was really focused on AI. It seemed to take up all the air oxygen out of the room. A lot of the other trends that we've been talking about kind of took a secondary seat with it. And as, we, and as I've been talking with um, our partners, our clients, other colleagues, I think one of the big things as we move into 2024, it's going to be we've got to make sure we're getting back to the business of training and, and enabling uh, the employees to succeed for the organizations that we're working in. So it's kind of like getting back to the fundamentals of what we need to be able to do. Uh, but the future component is with an, a, a lens on how AI will continue to um, you know, enable us, uh, the challenges it brings to the table, but also really driving that change management around us. So that's the blend for the back to the future strategy here. Um, it, it's getting back to the basics, but really thinking about how we're going to align that with the future component. I've outlined seven trends in here today that we're going to go over. Uh, they're probably closer to kind of 15 that I mapped out, but I figured that these seven I think will probably be uh, the bigger ones we're seeing at least early in the year. Uh, here we are at the end of January, and I would say I have had multiple conversations on most of these already this year. So uh, also reinforce that I would love to see a very active chat window. Uh, if you see something that you like or resonates, please drop it in there. If you have additional insights to share, I love that. Uh, be able to bring the insights and the brilliance of the community. If you have a question, don't worry about asking it. Raise it. We'll try and pick it up as we can. We'll also leave a little bit of time at the end to be able to do that as well. So just wanted to make sure that everybody is comfortable and ready to go. I know you know how the chat functions. I've seen everybody sharing. So I hope that we get a really vibrant conversation as we're going through. Also, the last thing is, is if you feel that you have a different opinion. I would love to see that in there as well. I, I you know, welcome that people challenge me all the time. I wake up every morning and my wife's challenging me. So I'm very accommodating and used to that. So, all right, let's kind of dig into our trends. And before I get there though, I wanted to kind of bring this, and this is one of my favorite quotes. I picked this up actually in graduate school when I was trained to be a classically trained instructional designer, but uh, this is actually attributed to Alvin Toffler. So this is a quote that came from Alvin Toffler as, as part of his book, uh, Future Shock. It actually was uh, derived from a conversation around what was in the book and how he's looking at this. And although this book is over 30 years old, 
I think we're still seeing value evolving from the insights with what was in that book. And I love this quote, the illiterate of the 21st century will be not those who cannot read or write, but those that cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. Uh, with all due deference to Alvin, I would also add to that to those who cannot connect, reconnect, and collaborate as part of the workforce of the future. I would add that. So it's not just the illiterate of not being able to read and write. It's these new fundamental skills that we're building in the workforce that's going to allow us to really succeed in all the disruption that we're seeing kind of moving forward. So, uh, but anyway, I love this quote. It's been one that's been out there for a while, but uh, I've been using it for a while. All right, trend number one is really talking about a skill-oriented infrastructure for the enterprise. And I think that this is really around talking about how do you get an, an infrastructure around a skilling framework that allows the organization to not only fill the existing gaps, but also moving forward to be able to uh, fill the emerging skill gaps that we're going to have for the evolving jobs of the future that integrate AI into the workflow, for example. So it's really about trying to create an infrastructure that's not only accurate, authentic, reflects the mastery of it. So if I say that I've mastered Excel, can I prove it? Can I show it? Do we actually have a shared understanding of what it means to be uh, a level 10 out of Excel mastery, for example. Uh, do I have that? Have I demonstrated that? And then how do I apply that to the actual work being done? So also bringing that forward. So really looking at, this is about starting to think about anchoring skills and our skills infrastructure, not just to job descriptions, but to the actual work and work outputs as well. So currently there's a lot of, um, talent mobility platforms or other platforms that kind of build on these skills taxonomies. And one of the things that's uh, been done, some interesting work that's been done is as they start to build these skills taxonomies, they've been building them out of, out of harvesting, uh, basically they put AI out there, it goes out to looks at hundreds of thousands of job descriptions that are out there and available. And looking at the job descriptions and the skill requirements, it's kind of able to kind of harvest those and bring those groupings together based on, you know, comparable type job descriptions or job clusters around that. So they have that. But what they don't have in the job descriptions is a description of what is the actual work and the work output that comes from that. And that's often organizational, uh, unique to an organization. But in order to be successful, you need not only the generalized skills that, that we're deriving from the positions, but also I need to be able to do the work itself. So it's that tying in those two components. So competency models and skills taxonomies I talked about, they're important and they have a value in the organization, but they are not enough. That last mile challenge has to be working the work description, how does the work and the work outputs really play in to be able to drive that home. Um, for, for example, if I'm looking at, um, I'm a marketing analyst and I'm in a marketing academy and I'm trying to gain the skills and we've built that marketing academy off some skills, the question is, at the end of that day, will I be able to create a brand plan if I'm moving into like a, a brand manager? I'm trying to progress into that role, for example. If I'm a brand manager, how will I actually create a brand plan that achieves success in the marketplace for our company with our competitors and our competitive environment? How do we create a brand plan that will succeed? There's a difference being able to identify the purpose, the function, the elements of and the actual authentic application as a work product. So what I'm saying is it's an and conversation to be able to reflect the two around that to say, digging deep in the skills infrastructure, that taxonomy, and then adding the work information, really moving it more towards a, a, a skills ontology with those work layers that are with it. So um, this, this is gonna be fundamental, not just for the jobs of today or the roles that we have humans playing today, but the ones that we have in the future. The other reason why I think that this is so fundamentally important is that in the future, we may have a role. Let's take the marketing analyst again. The, the job description on the marketing analyst may not change so much as the job description, but with the advent or the integration of AI into it, the work that an analyst will be done will be done differently. So if you look at that workflow and how you integrate that into those, um, that will be important to kind of pull forward with that. And so... What will happen is, is that if we don't anchor our job or skills infrastructure to actually the work being done, we will miss that difference between what the AI does and the human does under those, under those existing job descriptions. So it'll be important to do that. 
And Carly, I appreciate you asking about a layperson difference between a taxonomy and an ontology. Absolutely, I'll give you a real quick uh, description. Taxonomy is a very hierarchical, rigid structure in how we kind of line things up top to bottom. An ontology allows for more flexibility to be able to attach different types of data, unstructured data, unstructured information to a much more solid uh, taxonomy around it. So what I'm saying is, is that a skills taxonomy is very highly structured. You have skills nested within skills as it kind of builds in there, but they kind of in a very tight, rigid structure. What they allow is I can actually, the ontology allows me to wrap around additional information and data about what does that, what do those skills come to do to be able to actually drive outputs um, and performance criteria is just one way to be able to do it. So it allows for what we call uh, the, the attachment of unstructured data to highly structured data. I hope that helps. Um, if not, there are actually several great definitions out there. Uh, there's some great work that folks are bringing that forward. Um, and what I'll do is uh, I'll throw it in uh, at, at the end. I'll throw in uh, the deck and we can download it later. I'll add, add a definition for you. But thanks, Carly, for jumping in and asking that question. All right. Um, the, I already talked about how it's going to enable us to better respond to AI disruptions. Um, and, and I think it's going to be is that you want to make sure that you're able to pull all of that information in so that when AI starts to use this to generate very specific learning outcomes um, you know, to, for a learner. So I'm actually in the job trying to do it. And I'm trying to pull information that helps me be able to work, perform, grow for the next role. How am I going to be able to get the accurate information tied to the work that I'm doing? Having that work reflected is going to be absolutely important. And the last point really kind of comes in is that, you know, oftentimes the conversation around skilling or skills infrastructure is, is treated differently, whether you're in the business unit, whether you're in HR, or whether you're in L&D. And to solve this in the future, you're going to need coordination between all three. Because even if I were to use the word skill, the business unit will define it differently than the L&D group rather than the HR group. They will all refer to it differently, and they have different purposes and different intent for it. So one of the key things will be that alignment and that connection to kind of tackle this enterprise success. For a great resource, if you want to learn more about this and, and this kind of conversation around that anchoring to the work versus the job descriptions, um, there's a great book, Robin Jasuthan and John Boudreau talk about work without jobs. I recommend it. It's a great read. There are a couple of others in the series, um, but they're really starting to tackle not only the importance of anchoring to the work, but what does that mean for the integration and, and the change that AI will be, bring to the workflow itself? So anyway, that's our, that's our first one that we're looking at. But the question is, why is this important to do this? You know, it, there's a lot of energy around doing uh, a skill infrastructure to build that foundation in the organization. There's a lot of energy that can be done there. Um, but why is it important? And what we're seeing that, and this is a McKinsey, um, a, a visual diagram that kind of brings forward that there's two thirds of the 90 million at stake from disengagement by prioritizing six key employee factors. And what I've done is that those six get back to that 56 million to prioritizing those. But off to the right, I've kind of mapped that if you have a skill infrastructure that is organic, dynamic, accurate, can grow with the organization as forward thinking, it'll really be able to deliver, you know, the why are we doing that, which, which gets back to, you know, addressing that lack of meaningful work. The module skill structure will allow for workplace flexibility. We'll be able to kind of you know, readjust the work and the workflow to be handled by different folks, but the skilling can align with that flexibility. Uh, the skill frameworks can provide a path for career and progression, that transparency into how do I grow to my next role. And then the last one is that providing that skill structure and that pathing also provides that transparency, which will address, you know, be a step forward in addressing the gaps in fair in a fair and consistent manner across the board. So if, it's, if it was a question was like, is this value in doing this? Absolutely, I want to kind of pull this forward. There is value in doing it. I would recommend prioritizing in key areas that may be disrupted. I wouldn't try and boil the ocean immediately, but I would start in certain areas, getting that st stakeholder alignment as you're going forward, but get some early wins and early successes with that. And I think you'll start to see the payoff in that investment. <clears throat> All right, trend two is about really reskilling the L&D teams to really embrace a data-driven mindset. Um, and this is one of the changes, not only just for the broader organization, but 
the goal is to be able to think differently about data as just something we draw from insights, but actually it's probably one of our most precious resources moving forward. And it's going to be important for L&D practitioners to understand the value of that data. How do we structure that data? How do we vectorize or make that data available so that we can draw insights from it at scale, real time, over time? What we're looking at right now is from a Gartner statistics that 80% of organizational skills will have to be reprioritized or revisited because of digital business transformation by 2024. Here we are, and we are starting to see the actual work amongst this change, especially you start to integrate AI into the workflow. And you think about the human plus AI as part of that workflow. AI will take some of the work, but the humans will be adjusting to what they need to do in that overwork as they start to use it as a tool, as a peer, as an enabler, starting that AI starts to fill in with that. They're going to have to change those skill sets that they have to kind of effectively work in that space. The positive, I, I see that at least the executives recognize that skilling is critical to business success. And again, I call out for the L&D practitioners is because we often are so focused on helping the rest of the organization of skill, re-skill, cross-skill that we often don't focus on ourselves. But in order to actually move forward with the organization, deliver the value we need to, I think that we need to continue to grow ourselves in that. So the first thing around that data mindset is that data is the fuel that enables AI solutions. So if you think of like a large language model or the those, um, the, those large neural nets, as engines that help generate outputs, draw insights. Um, they actually, then data is the fuel that powers those. The better, the higher the quality, the fuel that goes into the engine, the better the output from it. So structuring and preparing the data will be crucial. It's gonna be an important part of it. You can't just point one of those big engines at a whole mass of data and it'll just automatically make sense of it. It will be able to do a lot of data processing and draw insights from it, but it does need to be structured. So as you are preparing data uh, to be used or generating data around your learning experiences, think about how you structure it so that it can be better consumed to draw insights at scale and or if content as part of the data package, how you structure it so that better can be consumed to be used to generate or grow or change modalities. Uh, many of the tools that we have seeing coming out, allow us to do that, but it has to be in an accessible format. Better designs through those insights, being able to look at how has your overall learning population responded to the experience, taking in those multiple touch points throughout those experiences and draw insights on that learner experience, that learner journey, to be able to not only prove that something works, but improve it over time. And then the last one is being able to implement those measurement strategies that allow us to strategically collect without having to go out and collect tons of new data are the ways we can find where we're pulling data currently from the organization, identify a few extra ways to be able to combine that data that's available out there to draw insights from it. So from an L&D perspective, it's about thinking about how we use structure, um, map, uh, access data across the organization to help drive better learning experiences and learning outcomes. All right, so I just want to check and see if there were any questions so far in the chat. Um, it seems like I hope, I hope everybody's kind of following along here. I uh, would love to see it. I do appreciate Carly throwing the first question out there. We'd love to see if there's any other questions out there. Um, or if you if you need me to explain anything a little bit more, I'd be glad to do that. But would love to see a little more activity out there. Trend number three is really looking at enabling the employees to achieve better work outputs through the integration of AI. So I think really the importance here is that um, and I like this quote by Paul Leonardi, AI, AI is not necessarily a th threat to the human workers, but a partner that can enhance their skills, creativity, and productivity. And I, and I believe that. As an, as an AI enthusiast, I believe it, but I am 100% pro-human. And people often ask me, say, will, will AI take my job, especially in the L&D space? And, and my answer is that you know, AI is probably not going to take your job. It'll probably be another person who uses AI better than you, a designer, a developer, uh, a program manager, somebody that uses the AI more efficient, more effectively, that's probably. So the idea is the call to action for the learning practitioners to be able to come out there and be able to learn to master these tools for their benefits um, safely, efficiently, and effectively to be able to do it. Because not all tools out there are straightforward or all of them are secure. So the idea is knowing when and how to use the AI tools appropriately to drive the outcomes that you need to. 
Now, this is another one. This is from IBM. These two are actually from uh, IBM out here that 40% of the global workforce will have to learn new skills or, uh, over the next three years due to AI implementation. This piggybacks off of the digital transformation that we were, data we saw before. In the end, a significant portion of the workforce will have to gain new skills, if not through basic digital adoption, also through the impact of AI. But here's the other one that I like, is that 80% of execs believe most positions will be augmented rather than replaced. Like wholesale, we're just going to get rid of all the humans and put bots in their place. That's not the pervasive trend. Will there be um, you know, consolidations through efficiency scales and scope? But that's normal what we see. The question is, how do we integrate it into what we're doing to be more efficient and more effective with it? And uh, thanks, Christine. I appreciate you sharing that out for the acknowledgement with that. Glad to hear that it's resonating out there as well. Um, so some of the finer points around this point is that, that focus on helping the human become the humans we need in the AI, uh, human plus AI equation. And what I mean by this is that a lot of organizations think that the adoption of AI is about technology adoption. It's really more about a human enablement, human transformation, and a change management effort than it is a technology adoption. It's not just how to use the tools, but how we think differently about creating the data that feeds it. So enabling the humans in the loop, as we call it, the humans that are preparing the inputs and, and engaging in the problem solving, the thinking about it before you get to the AI, and then on the outputs, evaluating, validating, interrogating, applying the outputs to make decisions, to, to drive outputs with it. That human that's in that loop system, we need them to play different roles. We need to be you know, focusing on that ethical application, that critical problem solving. Um, some of that enablement around taking those creative inputs and extending those and thinking through that, that application with that. Um, yeah, I think it's a great question, Christine. Uh, hearing that AI solutioning for development reaches deeply into the work itself, thinking about it on is a fair to think of AI implications around learning content as better functioning LCMS-ish. Um, I, I think so, but I think if if I have such a frame set on an LCMS that I don't think it completely applies, but I think in the vein, I think you, you've got a point with it, but it is going to go deeper than just like, we think of the learning content management system as something where you create the content and you display the content. I think with AI, you're gonna really cross the boundaries of the formal structured platform only into the informal meeting arranges of moments of need out there with that. So I think it's a good way to kind of throw it out there and start thinking about it, but it does change the boundaries of how we meet, how we connect, at what moment of need we're supporting them to be able to do that. Uh, it is evolving quickly to be able to do that. But higher higher order critical thinking, improving process systems, absolutely, those are, those are definitely skill sets. Curiosity, this is one. Curiosity is a uniquely human skill set. I've never had what I would consider a bot authentically go, riddle me this Batman, and I believe that it was truly curious. We can make it mimic curiosity, but is it in truly curious that drives innovation and new things with that? I believe that that is a uniquely human element. It's debatable to say that, that creativity is uniquely human, but I will say that AI plus humans can actually really become much more creative together. So it is clearly an enabler and enhancer in that creative process with it, but the humans have to be there to be able to bring that element to recognize, to bring that forward, not to just subsume it for us. So I think those are some of the key ways that we see out there and how that, that starts to show. Um, uh, let's see, these are great questions coming in. Appreciate that. Uh, what other data sources out there to understand what's working, not working? So one of the first places is really bringing in data from the business. So we start to think about learning transforming to performance, productivity in the workplace, starting to blend some of the learner data, the learning experience data with the actual work and performance data so that we can get an ongoing view to say, how are the most lagging business indicators affected by what we rolled out in a train? So looking at the most lagging to less lagging um, business indicators to key behaviors, things that are tracked in the workplace, being able to measure that a lot of that data can actually be uh, consumed. And that's a lot of data to help start to look at trends with that. So uh, I think that that's important to kind of think about where are the sources in the organization, where are we pulling those data from? 
Uh, let's see, what role does organization design play in successfully considering those trends? I'm telling you, I think it is an integrated view. Not only will the nature of the workflow change. So um, if you think about, so marketing is probably one of the uh, industry value chains. So if I'm in an organization, you have marketing, you have sales, a lot of that. Marketing is one of those that is actually getting disrupted with AI significantly. Uh, tools that are uh, to help create copy, to do competitive analysis, to do a lot of the strategy enablement things. Tools are being brought in to really enable and support that organization. So to create a, for example, a brand plan, you may use AI much differently than you have when you did it offline before. So your workflow is going to change as you're in there. As that delta for the human goes, the work changes, so will what the human does, and that delta for the human, that's where our sweet spot is for L&D to be able to help. So to that point, it gets deeper where we're bringing L&D from the classroom into the performance space. That boundary will become less of a structure. We'll start to see more of that back and forth to be able to say, can we deliver the change in the space? Because Enable AI is really going to push a lot of that. All right, let me push this out here. Um, critical thinking, all that's in here. But again, anchoring back to the workflow, I've hit that before, but that's the thing is, as we think about this, how do we get back to really identify how the business is going to use it and how is an L&D, are we going to use it to change the work that we do? The design, the development, the creation, the deployment, the data collection, the analysis, the assessments, the diagnostics, all the things that we do, how will AI get in there and start shaping and changing what, what the work we do as well? All right, let me push on to trend four here. Um, this one's really about integrating technologies with AI into the existing learning ecosystem. So we have two things that are kind of happening out there in the technology ecosystems that we have. So the learning technology specifically. And so if you look at that, we have existing tools we've been using for years. So Articulate's a common tool used in the organization. A lot of companies use this to be able to create uh, a web-based training, like a, a 20 minute module on a topic loaded into an LCMS or into an LMS and the learner takes it and it's got that next, next, next. And then you complete a quiz or a test at the end of it, something like that. So in kind of building that around that tool in itself has been part of the development ecosystem. So it's a technology that we've been using to build courses, but they themselves are rolling out and incorporating AI into its tool as well. So they're going to start to bring in the ability to kind of generate content or summarize data inputs that come in and start with an output that then a designer can refine, adjust on the other side. So they're starting to bring these things in. They're not the only ones to do it. Others are. But as an example, when we had a development tool in our ecosystem, they are changing by adding AI into them. You also have new entrants into the field. So you have Synthesia or Colossian and both of these tools are really powerful tools in the generation AI generated video space. So I type in a text uh, script or actually they actually have a script generator in there. So I could type in a couple of concepts, what I wanna talk about and through using a large language model like GBT4 on the back end or Anthropic or something else, it'll generate a, a, a narrative script. And then that script will be tied to a synthetic human avatar. And then the lips will be synced with it and it'll be spoken in the language. It can also be translated on the fly. So you have new tools which haven't been in our technology ecosystem before now coming in and adding uh, more value to be able to rapidly create like those talking head avatars uh, that you're actually able to, to generate through AI and, and the computer audio. And then on the fly, be able to translate that through machine learning to be able to change it into a different language, a different dialect, for example. So a lot of those tools have the potential to be able to um, improve, to speed things up, to allow us at least maybe bring things to scratch tracks before maybe we go to final. Many of them may be good for final. It all depends. But each of those tools as we bring them in, we have to think about what is the impact with that. So first of all, is it secure? Does it secure the data in a way that we want it to? Or is that data behind the scenes? When I load up a script that I wanted to write, and create the outputs for, is it training the data, the uh, large language model? Is the data secure in our corporate security environments? These are the things we have to start looking at to make sure that the power that the tools bring are balanced by the security, managing the data, protecting sensitive information, all that has to be absolutely in place. So 
that we can get the benefit of the tools, the, the, the speed, the efficiency in some cases with the security. But the next dimension that we're seeing is like, the, what's the social impact? So Colossian um, and, and Synthesia and Heijin, they also are now evolving and they're bringing new features. And one of the things they have is the ability to clone. So I could upload my likeness, I could upload my audio and, and it could start cloning my voice. And so the question here is, what do we do when it's in the process to be able to say, when and when should we not clone somebody's voice to be able to do this? So for example, in a new employee onboarding in a company, say you're a global company, you got new employees coming in and it wouldn't it be great if the CEO were to greet them in their native language. So we capture the English version of uh, the, the CEO doing the welcome connection with it. And then we use a tool like the three that I mentioned, and then and it's able to clone that person's likeness, their voice, and then say exactly what they're saying in another language. So if I'm a new employee in Thailand, I come on and I hear the, um, you know, the CEO of the company speaking in perfect Thai. Now, the question is, should you do that? Now, I mean, I think here's a question in authenticity and trust, and this is to be determined by the organization themselves. But if I'm a new employee coming in in Thailand and I see the CEO speaking in perfectly fluent Thai, I would assume that they speak fluent Thai. Now, is that is that an important enough distinction for the organization? It gets into one of those questions, ethically, should we do that? Is that a breach of trust of the learner? These are the things that we're talking about um, does the benefits outweigh this or do we put disclaimers along with it that says, you know, this has been, uh, you know, transmogrified, that's my language, to be able to be available in your in your local language or some type of that? How do we help bridge that gap? But let's take it one step further. Let's say we need to change something in the script. And now instead of going back to the CEO to have them re-record the first version, I can actually modify what they said in English as well as all the downstream languages. When and when should I not go ahead and be able to make a change? When should I have to re, you know, run it back through them to verify that? Or due to speed and availability, I can roll a change out quicker. These are some of the things that we have to think about from a security, um, the feature rich nature of it, the impact that it has, weighing those things as we go out. To, it's not enough just to say, can we, or look what we can do. The question is, what can we do ethically, safely using these tools. And I think that's a big part as we look at, and that's a big part of as we use them as humans, that's where the humans have to step in and ask those critical questions. We need to do them as an organization and we need to use them as individual users. Um, and, and you're right, it's a good a point out there, Lisa, that uh, the translations are not 100% accurate. It could possibly result in a false statement or something offensive, absolutely. So being able to know in that restructuring of the process, where you, you went through a traditional translation process and probably had humans at key points, human translators checking the process. Where do you bring in that layer of controls in the new development process that still allows you, affords you the speed and the efficiency, but the quality control that you're looking for? These are the things that we have to kind of think about. That's just a perfect example of how we need to rethink in our L&D space, how we're going to think differently about the work that we do. Where do we put the new checks in? How does the new process flow out? Um, it's not just a 100% automagic experience. Humans are throughout the process, but they're in different ways, in different places. And if you want to really get to the scale and the efficiencies, you have to be very, what I would say, uh, adept on using the tools and understanding where the strengths and weaknesses of them are. But it's a great point. I love that. Um, interoperability versus integration. Ah, that is a good question, because I would say even interoperability in the history has been a challenge in and of itself. But we are seeing, I am starting to see what I consider AI integrating deeper into the tools that we're using, whereas historically they've been layered over. I'm starting to see more of that in an integration and a, and a best practice in the adoption of AI for a business is that it truly integrates into the workflow versus a layer over. There was a McKinsey stat, and actually there was an analysis that came actually out before uh, the release of generative AI. And they were looking at the amount that companies were investing in AI and what their perceived return on that investment was. And those that actually had in integrated 
AI had integrated instead of layering over actually received a much higher perceived return on that investment. So uh, what about legal questions? Right to my voice, right to my likeness. What can you do? Absolutely. Um, and I think that that's a good question. Um, that That is, it is a, and legal, it is stretching the boundary of legal. There's a lot of questions about this. And, and let me just say, and Chad, I, I love I love your comment here. Um, there are two things about this that I think everybody is, is that acknowledging that there's a lot of information, a lot of change, and all that's coming out. And it is very natural to feel in that sense of overwhelmed and a lot of fatigue. But, you know, seeing the potential of things happening out there, anybody who tells you that they got this 100% nailed is lying to you. I'm going to tell you that there's a lot of things unfolding every day. And, and I do a fair amount of reading of this as we're integrating within that yet. Um, uh, I believe Articula is coming out with their AI soon. I don't know when it was launched. I'm not familiar with that, but I believe they are coming out with it. I've heard uh, it's in that space to be able to do that if they haven't rolled it out already. But anyway, all this information, getting back to the fatigue with this is that helping ourselves as part of a change management process for ourselves, helping us get through this process because this is not the end of the journey. More change is going to be able to become. How do you manage and at, can keep the right questions that you're asking as you're going through? Um, keeping kind of that North Star as you're starting to grow and use these tools is absolutely going to be critical for this. So that's some of the ways that I've started to think through it. One of the first steps we did at GP Strategies was we integrated um, what we thought to the responsible use of AI, what we call our guidelines. And, and these aren't very specific on how to use this tool or that tool. These are guidelines that says no matter what the tool is or how we use AI, we outline these core responsibility guidelines for the employees as we start to see them coming across because we don't know exactly how they're going to manifest or when they're going to wash on our shores, but we should have a guidepost of how we think we're going to integrate with them, how we're going to think about using them, how we're going to apply them. So Anyway, I, I just want to say to out there, I wake up every morning and I feel like I'm on that Savannah plane. What's that old African adage? Everybody gets up on the morning when the sun rises, everybody starts running. The question is, are you chasing? Or are you being chased? I feel in the AI stage that I am being chased every day with uh, with new, uh, I used to think I was chasing, but I'm feeling that it's always coming out. So anyway, just to, just to help out with that, that if it's feeling overwhelming, there's more to come. But the idea is more that we can share with each other, the more we can learn, drive insights. I think that's one of our unique powers in our industry is our willingness to share information, to grow and learn from each other. We're going to have to do that. This is going to take a community effort to really change the industry. Let me jump in here real quick. Uh, look at this first bullet point. All tools are constantly emerging and changing. If you, if you like I talked about two of the AI generated tools, in six months, they rolled out three new significant features in six months, and that pace is not going to stop. It's going to continue with that. But as we're going through, push for the transparency, understand how AI is being existed. Where is that data being used? How is it making decisions? How is it providing feedback? What are the checks? What are benchmarks? Ask the partners of the vendors that provide these. How do you know that this is good? What are your metrics? How do you know that the output for this is? Really start to chip away at that perceived black box about the large language models or AI in the background. You have to start asking in, uh, intelligent questions uh, going through that. Know how the data is handled. Think about the tools. Thinking about the tools and categories is a way that I've kind of helped with the overwhelm. So instead of looking at you know the hundreds and hundreds of new platforms that are emerging out there, I start to put them in the categories. So for example, AI generated video. When I talk about that, it has emerging with it for all the platforms in it. It will generally have societal issues, ethical issues, technology issues, security issues, all those things that tie to what it's trying to do. So I put these categories together. So I look at AI generated audio, AI generated video. I look at productivity assistance like otter.ai, fireflies.ai, these tools, those are interesting concerns. You know, what, what are the social impact? I mean, we did a pilot of productivity tools and these are bots that you actually can bring in and they follow you to meetings and they take meeting notes for the meetings that you're at. And then it summarizes and sends it to you and calls out action items, things like that as you're going. Now, here's the interesting part is that these tools that are set up in your space, like otter.ai, it can actually access your calendar and it can go to a meeting on your behalf that you're not into. 
So socially, here's one of the interesting things, which I think is, would make a great cartoon, but I pop into my meeting and all I see are four productivity bots and nobody else in my meeting. So it's me and four productivity bots and all the humans are off in other meetings or doing other things. You know, the question is, is when, when do you, what are the social protocols around sending your bot to a meeting without announcing or gaining permission to be able to do that? If a bot comes in without a participant, can I kick that bot out? Where is the data stored for that bot when it's doing the transcripting, the summarizing? How long is that information, that intelligence stored? If we had an incident, let's say we have a live meeting, there's a bot there and somebody yelled at somebody and now we have an incident that we need to respond to. Who controls that data? Is that data become part of an internal HR or a legal? These are things that we have to be thinking about when and how we use these tools. The productivity tools offer a lot of help, a lot of really good help. I mean, if they can help gather meeting notes, which is probably one of my biggest struggles is getting real good uh, meeting notes. And I use them to help fill in the pieces. But the question is, I got to know the strengths and weaknesses of those. So anyway, having those categories of tools. So all that category of tools will have some of the very same issues as we think about looking at them and using them as we move forward. So the categories, instead of like thousands of tools, I get them down into like 15 or 16 categories that we're looking at that are most pressing coming into our space. So um, I love identifying use cases and narratives and thinking through um, like the personas. How will people use these tools? What will that come out of it? So the use cases and the personas can help really drive insights into how and when we should use the tool uh, in our organizations. So that, that's going to be really critical, I think, when we start to move on around that. Um, let me kind of push ahead. I know we've, we're coming across here. So we got trend number five is embracing scenario-based learning labs. And this has been one of the things I talked about is being able to prove uh, that, you know, folks have the actual skill sets that they have. So how do we go about that? Um, again, one more skill gap. This is another gardener that says 20% of the employees have the skills needed for both their current role and their future career. So not only do we have good insights on the existing skill sets, but 45% of job seekers lied about or exaggerated their AI skills. So imagine I'm I'm a new employee. I got in and and I'm on my and I'm in my new job. And my boss asked me to do something, but wait a minute, I don't really have the skill set to do that. Imagine the challenge for that new employee to be able to say, okay, do I acknowledge that maybe I don't have the skills what they're doing, or am I quiet about it and try to complete it as we're moving forward? So these are some of the things that we have to think about how you actually bring that in. Um, trend five, again, really is embracing scenario-based learning labs to prove and improve employee proficiency. How do we know that the employee has the skill sets that we said that they had is really what I'm talking about. So skills inventories that have historically relied on self-reporting. Uh, so there are tools out there you can say, uh, rate your skills on one to 10 related to Excel or PowerPoint or Word or whatever. And for example, I could go out and say, I'm a nine out of 10 on Excel. I get in and then somebody asks me, says, great, I need you to do something, but I need you to use, and it uses pivot tables. I don't know anything about pivot tables. So should I have rated myself at a nine? Do we have the rubrics behind that to actually validate so that it says this is the skill sets we need to have those in place? So um, that's really looking at, but skill labs are ways in which we can actually put performance-centric ways to have people demonstrate their mastery. So instead of asking me about my Excel proficiency, I could go through and actually complete uh, in a lab key Excel tasks that would then help me give an authentic, accurate display to where I am. So even if I go into a job, I not only may go in with full transparency with where my skills are, or I'm in a job, I'll have the transparency, but also gives a great development plan of where I can go, who we can anchor off a realistic positioning where you're at. So skill labs are able to do that. Um, there are several platforms out there that are able to, that are really growing up to be able to do this. Um, they are both for like what I consider the tech field, the manufacturing, uh, other types of fields in, in, in the crafts and trades that are out there to kind of help with this process. Um, human skills, absolutely. There are uh, companies working on what I would consider 3D VR experiences, which will have a series of increasingly complex scenarios that allow you to see how they responded to those to give an objective rating with that. Uh, and that also allows a human observer to also rate and evaluate the performance as well. Uh, influence, strategic thinking, executive presence, much harder to actually 
uh, track and do. But I think as we start to look at how these tools are used, getting more uh, efficacious examples of those are coming along. We are currently working on some, but we want to make sure that they are uh, getting out there. And, and there are versions of those AR experiences that don't have, require a headset that are what I consider low immersion, that you're in the space you're able to respond to. So there's a range of those as well. Um, uh, please share more. So Skill Labs, probably one of the most uh, proficient ones we've got is like Skillable, for example, will help in the technology space around certain tech applications. It's a very ex example of one that I need to be able to show proficiency in certain backgrounds and, and techn technology skills. That's They've built a series of labs that enable you to be able to kind of go through and prove that inside. So let me jump here to trend six. Uh, we're getting closer here. So infusing AI into extended reality enabled learning for more immersive experience. Boy, that's a mouthful, a lot of jargon in that. What I mean about that is, is how can we bring AI into uh, situations where we start to have uh, immersive experiences out there? So one of the things we'll do is create an escape room and we can have a manager set up an experience for their extended team. They all can't come forward to be able to be in the same location to do, for example, a team building exercise. But what we can do is go into a virtual experience and have a team building exercise at the same time inside of an escape room type activity where we can work on communication, problem solving skills, but we can all do it, whether through a headset or through their laptop, be able to kind of do that problem solving as a team, for example. But bringing AI into that allows us to be able to make those scenarios deeper, richer, and be able to evolve on the fly versus the very deterministic ones that we've set, which kind of have more preset uh, experiences with them. Uh, one of those things that we're looking at is looking at agents, for example, AI-based avatars that are driven by these agents to be able to create specific personalities with contextual awareness that can access your company data to be able to answer questions from your pre-approved internal company information. And that allows you to be able to extend the personalized learning experience. So this is an example of one, this is a platform called InWorld. And here's an example of being able to, let's say, again, I'll do new employee onboarding. What if I were able to actually extend my human contact point? So a new employee comes into the organization. One of the biggest challenges we've had is like, how many, you know, how much time somebody has to be able to respond to and ask all the critical or answer the critical questions a new employee may have? How can I assure that we are able to get some of that connective uh, touch points that are out there? So being able to expand the human network that's there to help the new employees, but create a series of these learning support agents. So what's different about these bots of the future is first that you can actually create a little more of that that virtual component to them. They start to look human-ish, but not. we're not trying to say they're full humans. But what's important is I can create a persona. I want this bot to respond with this kind of attitude, temperament, speak with these kind of ways so that when they are generating responses, answering questions, they do it in the characteristic of what we've designed for that agent, but is able to pull the information from internal resources, for example. And so, uh, for example, one of the things we used to do was like a bot, for example, like Acronym Annie is an example of a great one. Um, Mobile Coach and so after several other companies do these great ones, but they were often very pre-programmatic. So if I'm a new employee sitting in a meeting, I get all these three-letter acronyms that I have no idea what they are. The old, old way is that, well, we have a spreadsheet on the internet somewhere. You can go in and find it and look it up and figure out what they're talking with. But who does that? So for the first couple of days, you're trying to track along. You're not going to stop and ask people, what was that again? What is that again? That's just either annoying or you don't want to show that because you're feeling vulnerable as a new employee. But what if I had an actual bot that I was able to ask it and say, so what is this three-letter acronym? Well, what we can do is not only have that spreadsheet of definition and terms, but also maybe some additional information about a couple of those three-letter acronyms. So the, the bot can actually come back with a definition, but genera generate additional information around what that term is, giving me more critical context about it on the fly while I'm there. I can pull it up through my device, for example, but it's in a way, instead of just giving me access to the spreadsheet or just pulling a single line and repeating it verbatim, it can start to generate based off of what's behind it. So these are ways that we can start to use 
the AI kind of feeding through some of our traditional bots to create more of a immersive, more touch points with it. This journey is just starting, but we are we exploring these uh, these new evolution, this new wave. You're going to see a lot more of them coming out, but it will continue to get better as we're going on. But I think there's a lot of ways to kind of increase and extend the human contact, not replace it, to extend it. And the idea is to say, can we provide immediate 24-7 coverage, but for those deeper things that require more context or co deeper conversation, create the space for the humans to have those critical conversations. Bring me to the last one here. We'll bring it home with the last one, which was really, and this is important, is about preparing leadership to make deeper human connections in a new age of disruption. And this is, this is one of the things that we start to look at. How do we help our leadership think differently? And, and I think one of the things that we are going to have to rethink, what is the role of a leader or a manager in the age of AI? So one of the terms I've started to adjust personally is when I talk about workforce, I used to be talking about humans only. In the future, workforce will mean humans plus bots, human plus AI as you're going through. So it's going to be something. So as I am leading an organization that oversees a workforce as being as one of its most powerful assets in an organization, I have to think differently how I start to integrate, respond to, connect, motivate, uh, that population, especially the humans, but in the humans in the context of that full workforce. So I think for me, this is this is a big thing that I believe is all the energy that we're doing as we search to find the better AI tools that are coming out here. I will feel that we will have failed if, if all the energy we've done to create this AI to do this, if we haven't created space by taking the tasks that are better managed and done through AI. If we haven't created the space for humans to have the conversations we need to, to innovate, to grow, to challenge, to change mindsets, to be able to, to develop with each other, this, if we haven't, we don't do that and we don't step in and succeed with that, I think it will be a very missed, uh, a large missed opportunity for us. But I'm believing that's where we're going. And a lot of the initiatives we're pushing for is the assumption that let AI do some of these things so that I can get back to doing these other things better or differently than I have. So for example, if I think about the performance management conversation, I'd say most organizations feel that they are not 100% happy with how consistent and the high quality of their performance management conversations happen in the organization. Are they consistently happening all the time? Are they really good conversations? But the reasons why they don't happen is like, I couldn't find time to schedule it. I forgot to schedule it. It's hard to collect data and feedback from peers to be able to share to the manager and the employee for an informed discussion. Being able to get real time and information or insights from thought leaders on how to have great experiences to be able to do that. And then I got to have the conversation. I got to document it. I got to file it. And then theoretically, I got to follow up on making sure that we did the things we said we were going to do. Now, what AI can do is out of that, AI can help significantly with a lot of those other tasks through either automation or generation of new pieces of information coming in to be able to generate a summary. So for example, AI could go out and collect feedback from the individual's peers. It could summarize, generate a summary from it. And as the manager, I could validate against what I'm seeing to make sure it's accurate, but drive that. It could be shared then with the employee. So when we come to a conversation, we're starting with good information and data, have a really robust conversation. Then AI, on the other hand, can help with the summarization, assuming the AI, you know, that the humans are going to approve it, but they can help file it, put it out there, call out the action items, and then follow up for behavior change over time. So AI can kind of take away some of those other asks, but here's the real latent trap that's in here for us is that, okay, let's say we make it easier for us to have conversations. We have to have better conversations. We won't have the excuse of saying, well, I didn't have the time. I didn't have the data. I didn't have this to be able to have a good conversation. That means that the challenge for us as L&D practitioners is to help our organizations and our leaders have better, more efficient, more effective communications, uh, better conversations and insights. And that in and of itself is a challenge that could keep us busy for decades. But I think that that in all of this effort as we're doing, it gets back to focusing on the humans in the equation, helping us through that change management process as we start to go through how the business change, the organizational structure will change, the way we connect with customers, the way we get data from them, the way we're collaborating will change, keeping an eye on how we connect as humans to be able to grow and innovate 
create new value. That that is the real power behind this. So, I think uh, redefining the last one is really redefining the uh, what does a good leader look like and what does it mean. That'll be one of our challenges. That in the age of AI, in the age of a human plus AI workforce, what does that look like? So kind of brings me to my last slide here, which is, I love this quote from Doc Brown. Uh, I'm a big nut for 80s and 90s movies, but your future is whatever you make it. So make it a good one. We have that opportunity amongst ourselves. I personally, as an l and practitioner, I think this is an exciting time. I think that this is one of our biggest, put me in coach, I'm ready to take the shot moments because with AI, there's gonna be a big delta between how we used to do work and how we will do work in the future. That delta is our sweet spot. That's where we help shepherd the humans towards productivity. That's what we are able out there to do. So anyway, uh, time for a couple of questions. I know we got a couple minutes here, about three, four minutes. I'd love to pick a question or two. Kim, what do you got? All right, I have a question for you uh, that is, uh, do you have examples of change enablement modules for AI? Do you have an answer? Oh, we do have a couple of those. Um, we have a couple of examples that we're working on. We are helping organizations with their adoption of, of Copilot as a, just a very first example of many organizations are looking at one of the 27 variations of Copilot that are rolling out. So we do have some examples of that. Uh, we'll have some more on the, on the website, but if you want to reach out directly, uh, ping me, I will get you some more information as we have that available. So great question. Okay. Um, if anybody has any other questions, um, I don't see any more coming through, but there was a lot asked during the presentation. So a lot of information um, and we are coming almost at the top of the hour. So unless anybody has other questions, you can put them in there. Um, but otherwise, I want to thank you, Matt, for your time, as always. So engaging. Uh, and also uh, to those attended, I want to thank you for your time and attention. And we always love to have you join us on our GP Strategies webinars. Go to GP Strategies website to check out our new and upcoming webinars. And with that, I want to wish everyone on the call a wonderful and happy, productive rest of your day. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate it. This webinar was brought to you by GP Strategies. Together, we help organizations transform through their people. You can access more webinars or download additional resources by visiting the GP Strategies resource library. The link is on your screen and in the description.